How many of you can think of your most memorable moment as a child? I bet it includes, in some way, hiking, discovering, chasing, building something in nature. Maybe you recall the jar full of fireflies on a warm summer evening that you collected, or the fort you built with fallen branches from a tree. Your tennis shoes filled with water as you searched for salamanders under slimy rocks in a stream, or making wishes as you blew the seeds from a dandelion flower. These are the experiences that are becoming lost in our world of busy schedules, organized sports, iPods, PlayStations, TV, and other technologies that sometimes keep us from being in and appreciating the natural surroundings around us. We are fortunate to host Mr. Loop tonight. In addition to other books written focusing on family, nature, and community, he is chairman of the Children and Na Nature Network, a nonprofit organization helping to build the movement to reconnect children and nature. He was a columnist and member of the editorial advisory board for Parents Magazine and has helped to find Connect for Kids, the largest child advocacy site on the web. Speaking frequently around the country, he has appeared on the morning show on CBS, Good Morning America, Today, and the NBC Nightly News, just to name a few. An advocate and nature boy by heart, Mr. Louvre comes to us sharing his concerns that many parents, teachers, and community members face today finding the balance between work and play for their children in this ever-competing world while helping to foster a sense of wonder, curiosity, and respect for the natural world around us. In the spirit of both Winnie Palmer and Fred Rogers and the Benedictine tradition of hospitality, please let us extend a warm welcome to Mr. Richard Liu. Let me end by... Uh, talking about something else I've been thinking a lot about since the book came out, which is how we talk to ourselves and how we talk to young people about the future, particularly the future of the environment. Um, I was asked to speak at a high school last year. I didn't want to go. I was tired. I was back from a trip. Then I started feeling guilty because I wrote this big book about kids, and okay, I'll go. So I went. I expected, uh, I expected uh, 20 kids, and there were 200. They were given extra credit. Um, I talked for an hour, and uh, you could have heard a pin drop. Now, I was astonished. These are high school kids. I expected gum smacking and note passing. Now, that's the teachers. But the, uh, but the kids were, were just on the edge of the They were really, really listening. Now, it's not because I'm a great speaker. I'm not. I'm okay. It was something else. It was, I talked about two things. I talked about the fact that their health not an abstraction, their health, is connected to their experience of nature. And the second thing I talked about was the fact that because of global warming and all of these issues environmentally that we do face, whatever we want to call them, in the next 40 years, everything must change. We'll need new kinds of agriculture. It's already beginning. We'll need new kinds of energy, obviously, already beginning. We'll need new kinds of urban design and architecture. It's already beginning with green urbanism and biophilic design. Everything must change. Now, to a 16-year-old, that's good news. Whole new careers will emerge that don't even have a name because everything must change. When they left, uh, the biology I turned to the biology teacher who had asked me to come, and I said, what was that all about? Why were they paying such attention? And he said, easy, Rich. You said something hopeful about the future of the environment. They never hear that. The message, they hear a lot of messages, but the main message getting through recently has been, it's too late, game's over. So why would we expect them to suit up for the game? He said a guy who was an expert from UCSD on global warming had come in two weeks earlier, and he said these kids' eyes froze over. We have been living in a culture of depression, a cultural depression, very much like, I believe, the economic depression in the 1930s. But we have, this has happened because we have become addicted to despair. When you begin to frame the future this way, it is very different. I'm a journalist. I don't like happy news for happy news sake. And I'm not saying that we should pull back for a minute from the bad news about the environment. We should tell more bad news. But we're missing two thirds of the story that, by the way, John Bonet and, you know, actresses that die and stuff are filling up. 
we're missing two-thirds of the story. And the two-thirds of the story we're missing is that everything must change. And we may be entering, being forced to enter, one of the most creative times in hundreds of years of human history. Because everything must change. Every generation wants to create a new civilization when they're that age. And what have people my age been telling them? The baby boomers? We've been saying, oh, we tried that, didn't work out. We have to change our message. We have to change the way we frame the future. Martin Luther King said again and again, in different ways, that any movement will fail if it cannot paint a picture of a world that people will want to go to. We have been failing at painting that picture. We must paint that picture. We must see a world that we want to go to. And it can be better. Biophilic design, they're finding that Buildings in which nature has been designed into it from the very beginning and kept there in communities. Productivity goes up. Absenteeism goes down. People are happier. People who are in schools with natural light get better grades. Test scores go up when you get kids outdoors. Eco-towns are emerging. I just visited one uh, a few weeks ago in uh, the Netherlands that are wonderful places to live. What if the second and third rung suburbs were replaced by things like that in which there's actually more density but more nature because of green roofs and because of streams that they have made out of recycled rainwater going through the community. And kids can go out where they are, not to Yosemite, but where they are and experience that. I was, spoke in Florida recently, the lieutenant governor introduced me, and beforehand she was talking to me and she says, Rich, do you think that things will ever be as good as they used to be? And when I spoke, I said, that gov lieutenant governor asked a, an interesting question, but it's the wrong question. The right question is, how can we make things better than they ever were? And we can, if we begin to paint a picture of a world that people will want to go to. And perhaps the first step in painting that picture is to simply take a child outside. Thank you.